leaders often say that our people are our most valuable asset, but when they're faced with pressures to cut costs, where do they usually go? They go right to the people that are presumably their best asset and they cut. Instead of looking for wasteful spending across the organization and cutting a little bit here, cutting a little bit there. Welcome to the My Future Business Show, where we get you in front of your best audience and keep you there. Not only are we interviewing the biggest names in business to help you become even more successful, we're inviting you to book your spot on the show to help you grow your business. So at the end of the call, make sure you fill in the interview application form at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the show. It's Rick Nusky. It's wonderful to have you here today. Now, on today's show, we're going to be talking about corporate hypocrisy, and uh, you know, we're going to take a deep dive into this topic with the wonderful Dr. Kendall Williams. Welcome to the show, Doctor. Thank you, Rick. Yes. Thanks for the invite. Absolutely, a pleasure to have you here. Now, as we've just been talking about offline, uh, you've certainly done a lot of work, and uh, obviously, we're going to be. Uh, talking about your work as an author, a public speaker, and your work as a lecturer. We're gonna be talking about your book, Visions, Values, and Corporate Hypocrisy, The Hijacking of Corporate Conscience. And I guess amongst other topics, we're gonna to take a, a deep dive into what hypocrisy is and how it's impacting businesses, employees, and consumers. Now, that's certainly a lot to unpack uh, in a relatively uh, short amount of time, but I'd love to um, start off by finding out where you're calling in from if we can. Sure, I live in sunny California, actually uh, Ventura County. And is that uh, summertime and at the moment? Yes, it is, yes. Yeah. So does it get really, really hot there? I have been there. Well, I'm, I'm fortunate to have uh, three or four beaches uh, within a five mile oh. drive, so I get that, that beautiful ocean breeze, which is fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. You know, living down in the valley, it's much hotter. Now tell me something, do you enjoy walking and taking in that beach? Because I, I can, I remember it being, there's some really beautiful beaches along that coastline. Well, occasionally I do. I, mm. I, I like to boat uh, and uh, I like to fish occasionally. So, you know, that takes me of course to the, to the, to the ocean. Mm. So what type and of I, fish are you after? Well, let me, let me just be deep, totally forthcoming. I'm not a great fisherman. When I do go, <laughs> I usually come back empty handed, but I, me like, too. When I do fish. I like to fish for largemouth bass. Bass, wow. Yes. So, yes. And, and what else do you enjoy doing? Do you like taking in a movie occasionally or anything else? Yes, yes, both big screen and, uh, and at home. Very good. Um, I, I enjoy tennis very mm -hmm. much. Uh, Any I good am, at it? I'm decent. I'm decent. <laughs> I've, lo I've lost some of my mobility as, I, as I've gotten older, but I'm still pretty decent. <laughs> <laughs> so did you watch the uh, Wimbledon final? No, I did not. My my favorite players, Coco Golf uh, and Serena Williams, were they were they were out, out early in yep. early rounds. Yep. Yes. Oh well, there you go. But I do enjoy watching my my uh, L.A. Lakers and my Pittsburgh Steelers. Oh wow, yeah, that's uh, you know uh, my sons absolutely love the NBA, and uh, you know this whole idea that Steph Curry was never going to make a grand final, and here he is holding up the <laughs> ring. They were super excited <laughs> about that. Did yes, Did yes, you watch that at all? I sure did. Yes. Yeah, fantastic. Who's your favorite player? I can't, I can't say I was rooting, though. I can't no. rooting for the Warriors, <laughs> to be honest. You can't do that. No, absolutely not. But no. no, who is your favorite player? Do you have one or do you? My favorite player was uh, Kobe Bryant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, rest in peace, for sure. Yes. Now, I'd love to talk with you a little bit about, uh, you know, music and f be, being a bit of a foodie. Do you like going out and enjoying some music and uh, having a nice meal occasionally? Uh, I don't frequent many live concerts. Um, mm -hmm. I just have this aversion to loud noises and big crowds. Yes, yes. I, I do enjoy music at home. Now, tell me a little bit about your, uh, um, your professional uh, educational background and your professional uh, uh, lecturing. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, sure. Um, you, you know, academically, um, I hold a PhD in industrial organizational psychology, mm -hmm. uh, a master's in um, organization management, and an undergrad in organizational uh, behavior. Wow, just just a few there. You've spent many years studying those. Um, yes, for sure. yes, I have. Yes, uh, indeed. Yes. As a lecturer, you would have uh, been introduced to many wide uh, celebrities and business owners and the likes. What are mm -hmm. some of the common themes and questions that come from your students? 
Well, first, most of my lecturing took place on the college uh, circuit. I taught uh, at the college level uh, for several schools like Penn State University, University of Phoenix, California National uh, University, and Fremont College. So I did quite a bit of lecturing there on management and leadership topics. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also do some lecturing, uh, you know, for uh, corporations. I've done some consulting uh, throughout, throughout my career. And to your question, one of the most common, uh, you know, things that, that, that leaders ask me is, what is the single most important Sorry about that. Um, That's what fine. is the single most important uh, uh, lesson that leaders uh, should learn mm -hmm. uh, in order to in order to gain and trust the trust and confidence of their direct reports? And my answer is always be authentic. And uh, that lack of authenticity, Rick, is what really inspired me to, to write the book. And I'm sure we'll we'll get into that later. Absolutely. We're going to take a, a deep dive into that for sure and certain now. I'm I'm wondering, you know, what's the one thing do you think you do the best? Is there a thing that stands out for you? You mean leadership wise? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's w winning the trust and confidence of my of my uh, direct reports at every uh, every uh, level. And I find that to be, I think, the most uh, glaring, gaping hole. Uh, leaders really don't they are so busy, focused on profits uh, at the expense of people. Yeah. Uh, and many of them fail to understand that profits are earn earned through the hard work of people. So in my view, Rick, uh, since since the labor cost represents about two thirds of mm -hmm. a company's P and L statement, then mm -hmm. it makes all the sense in the world to focus on 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 that piece. Yeah. When you can win the trust and confidence of your people, uh, they will they will be willing to contribute more of their discretionary effort towards accomplishing uh, business results. Yeah, that's great feedback. Thank you so much. Now yeah. I wonder. Yeah. I, I think about leadership in terms of today's uh, changing environment that we're living in a lot of people seem to be i'm not absolutely sure and certain but they seem to be doing a lot more working from home so how is it that the the leadership dynamic changes when people are not in front of other people physically well well many leaders struggle with the idea of managing people that you can't see and touch and feel uh, mm. every day but that is fundamentally flawed um, thinking first of all i don't believe that you need to manage people anyway mm. we don't need to manage people uh, as leaders i think people can manage themselves, yep. uh, especially when it comes to the millennial generation. They don't want to be managed and they don't want to be controlled. Yeah. Um, Rick, I've got three young adults that are obviously millennials. Um, and I certainly, they don't want to be, they, won't, they don't want me <laughs> watching everything they do. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I'm very young children. They say the same thing. Daddy, yeah. well, leave me alone. Yeah. Right. <laughs> But more, more to your question, though, um, you know, now that folks are working from home, I think uh, leaders need to need to really learn the importance of giving people space and freedom uh, to do to do their jobs and simply to leverage technology to keep that engagement uh, going. Yeah, absolutely. Great feedback. Now, we're obviously going to take a far greater look at your book and all of the contents within it. But I often sure. I like to think about what makes life worthwhile. What's what's the answer for you? What makes life worthwhile for me? Mm. Um, I would say the I, I really seem to get enjoyment out of helping other people grow and prosper. Mm -hmm. um, that includes family members and, of course, uh, people that I work with. I'm known for being a very loyal and supportive uh, leader who takes a lot of pleasure and pride in, in helping uh, people to grow and prosper, especially uh, into leadership uh, roles. Yeah, fantastic. Now, do you find where you're at in your life now that you're far more comfortable sharing your wisdom and your knowledge than you were early on? Do you, you know how there's that continuous improvement of ourselves? Well, you know, I, I can't say that, I, that I'm any more gratified today than I was uh, 20 or 30 uh, years ago. Even as a young leader, I always took pleasure in, uh, in, in supporting people around me. And uh, I was fortunate to rise through the ranks with uh, AT&T uh, years ago, earlier in my career. Mm -hmm. And I just really, uh, you know, I noticed that I had a real, um, you know, a real uh, you know, ability to help other people to realize their full potential. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And to help, help, help pave the way for their growth. Now, I know that you are an operations uh, leader, VIP. Is that still current for you? Yes, it is. Yes. Fantastic. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, sure. I, um, I'm currently senior, senior vice president for a large contact center here in Ventura County. Mm -hmm. And I have spent um, uh, the better part of 30 years in, in similar roles working for companies like, again, AT&T, where I spent half of my career in uh, nationwide insurance uh, and other uh, smaller uh, organizations. 
I think about the the word customer, you know, and customer experience. I know these are important things for you. Tell us a little bit about your perspective Mm -hmm. of customers and customer service and experience. How important Mm -hmm. are they? Well, Rick, I, you know, I define customer as uh, there's, there's a, it's a double sided coin. You have your paying customer and then you have your internal customer. Mm-hmm. So I view my direct reports as uh, as as customers and my indirect reports as customers, anyone reporting up to me. Yep. Um, and I find that by focusing on the people within your organization and helping them to grow and prosper, you don't even have to worry about the the end customer. Yep. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the old customer supplier model, which which focuses on leadership and how they serve their people internally. And when you serve your people internally, they will do their level best to deliver a product or service that people want to buy. Yes, fantastic feedback. I often think about training, um, you know, because a lot of people assume that, oh, yeah, people just naturally are good at uh, delivering good customer service. Now, is training mm-hmm. a, an important component mm-hmm. in a business, regardless of its oh, size? Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But I do think that, you know, to be to be good at customer service, you do you do have to have some innate qualities. That is a a desire to help people, Mm -hmm. a desire to service others. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, um, I I know that it's one thing to serve, but from an internal perspective, we always need to be looking from a HR perspective of how we manage performance. Now, is there Mm -hmm. any particular metrics that stand out for you over others that are, you know, relatively simplified? Uh, any particular metrics in the call center environment? Um, well, there are several metrics that I think that, that, that stand out. Um, one is quality, of course, quality assurance, which every organization measures, uh, measures quality. Mm. Um, I think, you know, employee, uh, the em- employee, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, opinion uh, surveys are very, very important because that tells leaders how their employees feel about working within the organization. Yeah. Um, why they leave the organization and equally important is why they stay with the, with the organization. Um, net promoter score is another important uh, yes. one because that measures how your how your customers feel about your product and or your service. Mm. Uh, net promoter score is measured by the uh, the um, the um, the um, people that 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 are willing to, willing to go out and enthusiastically uh, you know yep. uh, promote your company minus the detractors and that gets you your net your net. So that's score. that that's Very the scale important. between zero to ten, isn't it? That's that. Typically, typically yes. Right. Yeah, it seems overly simplified, but you know, I think you need to mm-hmm. read between the lines and the, I guess, the human psychology behind that scale. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very easy for human beings to understand. Zero means I'm not happy. Ten means I'm happy. Is that right? Right, right. That's Fantastic. correct. Now, in terms of the leadership question that we talked about earlier, um, I'm wondering um, when we when we look at the leadership model, and you and you said you don't really manage people per se because they're not necessarily in mm-hmm. front of you. Um, mm-hmm. How is that managed in terms of corporate risk and a corporate risk profile? Can you talk to us about risk? Uh, I'm not sure I, I understand the question there, but I would like to say that when you, as a leader, um, I think it's important that you create an environment that encourages people to contribute their personal best. Yep. So I focus my efforts on managing the environmental influences on employee morale and inspiration. Yep. Yeah, that's I don't perfect. focus directly on managing the employee unless he or she is underperforming. Yeah, fantastic. Now, I'd love to shift gears if we could and talk sure. about your wonderful book by starting off by asking you, what is hypocrisy? Mm-hmm. Let's clarify that um, in terms of how it relates mm-hmm. to this book. Mm-hmm. Well, hypocrisy is defined uh, simply as, uh, as, as, as uh, it's whenever there's a misalignment between what leaders say and what they actually do. Mm-hmm. That's what I define as hypocrisy. You say one thing, but yet you do another. Yeah, and, and that's a question I had is how wise, widespread is do as I say and not as I do in business environments? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it is very, very, very widespread. And I think one of the most glaring uh, uh, forms of hypocrisy is when companies say they use a trite phrase, uh, the catchphrase, our people are our most valuable asset. Hmm. And that concept, number one, it's overused. And number two, um, it, is, it is fundamentally uh, flawed. Millennials don't necessarily like to hear that unless you put your money where your mouth is. Um, and that's wrong for two key reasons. Number one, people are not assets. People do not meet the, the, uh, the, um, the, the basic tenets of how the generally accepted accounting principles defines an asset. Mm. It must be owned and controlled. It must have a defined value and mm. it must be transferable. Neither one of those apply to humans. 
humans don't want to be owned and or they don't want to be controlled. It goes back to the industrial revolution, doesn't it? You know, we're here to yes. create manufacturing machines and we must pump out stuff yes. at all costs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, but the second reason why that uh, that phrase uh, is is fundamentally flawed is because there's what I what I call a say do deficit, and I talk about this in the book, mm -hmm. where leaders say one thing and they do another. For instance, Rick, uh, leaders often say that our people are our most valuable asset, but when it comes time to when they're faced with pressures to cut costs, where do they usually go? They go right right to the uh, to the people that are that are presumably their best asset, and yeah. they cut. Uh, Instead of looking for wasteful spending across the organization and cutting a little bit here, cutting a little bit there. Which I'm sure you find plenty of, right? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Now, Absolutely. in terms of, uh, I guess, demographics and differences in generations, are you finding this um, problem, let's call it, to be more prevalent uh, in, say, the boomers versus millennials, or is it across the board? Well, I think the problem is across the board, but I think that millennials kind of bring a, a new uh, mindset to, to organizations, and they're not as willing as previous generations uh, to accept the status quo. Mm. Millennials will, will certainly call you out, and they'll call you out in public forums. Yeah, fantastic. Well, it's good because, you know, they're standing up and, and being heard. Now, um, tell us a little bit about corporate conscience. What does that mean? Mm. Well, the, I think when I talk about corporate conscience in the book, um, I'm really speaking of, of, of leaders who, generally speaking, they began their leadership careers as shining stars, and then they become falling stars because they succumb to the traditional way of, of doing business, and that is where profits, profits uh, must be met, margin must be met at, at, all, you know, at, at, at all expense. Yeah. People, people be damned. People be damned. Yeah, well, look at the yes. end of the day. Um, people are what makes businesses, not the other way around, isn't it? Absolutely. Thank yes. you for the feedback. Now, I know where your mission to promote people before profits now come from, but where did the idea for actually writing the book, Vision, Values and Corporate Hypocrisy, come from? Well, Rick, I've always had an interest in treating employees with the respect and honor and dignity that they expect and frankly mm -hmm. deserve. Uh, as I said earlier in this interview, uh, since labor costs represents two thirds of a company's total spend, I've always understood the importance of focusing on that you know that piece of the balance that sheet component. because when you do that yep. everything else falls into place um and through my doctoral studies um i i read just just tons and tons of of, of studies on this matter for example according to a 2016 gallup study uh, that revealed that only 23 percent of america's workforce uh, feel that they can apply their company's values to the work they do every day and sadly, only 27% strongly believe in their company's values. In other words, they ain't buying what we're selling. Yes, it's just paper. It's pen on paper, isn't right. it? Right. And Rick, yeah, absolutely. And what seems to be fueling this sentiment, Rick, is a new and invisible force at work in American corporations. Uh, and in my view, it's the most flagrant and shameful business model uh, in the history of, of our country. And it's called Wokonomics. Okay. And Wokonomics is a term that I believe was coined by uh, a, a new author named Vivek Ramaswamy. Mm -hmm. uh, he's an entrepreneur and uh, an author. He wrote a book called Woke Inc. And he refers to it again as Wokonomics. And Wokonomics is a term used to describe advertising campaigns designed to appeal to millennials by infusing woke values into um, big business. Wow. And it works like a magic trick. Um, leaders do it by pretending to care about something other than profit and power precisely to gain more of each profit of power yeah yeah it's sad isn't it you know it, yes it it's, is. it's a crushing attitude and behavior towards industrial growth and economics in general and i don't think it's um united states based i think it's globally would you agree with that absolutely yes yeah wow so uh in terms of hypocrisy how damaging can it actually be? I think we're starting to unpack that. But I guess another relevant question is how rapid could that damaging impact take place? Days, hours, weeks? Well, I think I think it depends. You know, some companies get away with it for years, uh, but they eventually, um, you know, um, reach the same, uh, you know, the same conclusion, conclusion where they're called out in, in, in public forums. And Rick, this happens with some of the largest companies in the world, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, like Facebook, of course. Yeah, you know, uh, Gillette, you know, you name it. It's 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 rife, isn't Amazon. it? Amazon. Yeah. So I'm wondering, 
what are the, I guess, some of the practical um, uh, outputs or um, actions people can take as a result of reading your book? What can we do? Well, uh, I would like to just just kind of share some some lessons learned. Talk, Thank you. Uh, yep. Some some of the lessons learned in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, number one, key actions that leaders can take to inspire and retain their employees. Uh, number one, trust and responsibility. Mm-hmm. Trust that your people inherently want to do a good job. Lay out their responsibilities um, and, and drive accountability. Number yep. two, you know, appreciation. Recognize people for a job well done. Number three, you know, guidance and, and mentoring. People want to be guided and mentored, especially millennials, which now represent about 48% of the U.S. total uh, labor force. Number four, learning opportunities. People want to learn and grow and prosper. And number five, they want communication and transparency. Certainly a lot there, isn't it? I, 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 yes. The thing that came to mind when you're saying these things, um, can you teach an old dog new tricks? Meaning uh, like a leader that is, you know, embedded in this this idea that it's profits before people, can they be, for lack of better ways to put it, turned around to become people over profit? Well, I believe all leaders can be turned around. But again, it takes a groundswell of employees to make that, you know, to make that happen, the folks that report to uh, uh, to, to their leaders. Tell yes. us a little bit about those companies that have shareholders. How much more difficult is this this idea of doing that in those environments? Uh, yeah, shareholder pressure um, is. Uh, I think that's one of the driving forces behind corporate uh, hypocrisy, and it absolutely makes it uh, makes it much more challenging for 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 business leaders. In fact, uh, you know, shareholders in my current organization. So, you know, I've worked for many companies that do have shareholders. So I've I recognize the, uh, the the difference where leaders uh still at every level there they seem to be preoccupied with the shareholders wants and desires at the expense of their employees but i think it is certainly uh worthwhile for leaders to understand what their people want as well because that in Mm -hmm. turn delivers uh, on the uh, to the bottom line and shareholders would never never (laughs) ever frown (laughs) uh at that but just changing your business model and delivering more to the bottom line yeah fantastic feedback i'm absolutely loving this call now do you think a, a focus on people before profit will actually help reduce turnover inside of a business and increase sales? Well, absolutely. I mean, if we look at why people leave organizations, um, yeah, they leave again because primarily because of a lack of, you know, a lack of feeling of belongingness, a lack of communication. And as as the saying goes, people don't leave jobs; they leave poor or bad leaders. Mm, mm, absolutely. I I noticed that. Um, with the changing demographics and aging populations, what what are the new challenges that leaders are facing in the workplace? Well, I think you know we we just talked about one of the challenges here, and that is the this whole shift uh, to remote working. Mm. I believe that remote work is is the wave of the future. Yeah, and many of your autocratic leaders that are used to to managing and browbeating the people uh, in the workplace, uh, they're going to find it really tough. Uh, to uh, survive in this new world that we now live in, thanks to the pandemic. So, did you enjoy writing this book? Did did the words just flow off the off the pen? And how did you write it? Did you actually grab a pen and piece of paper, or did you just type into computer? Let's talk about that. Well, well, it took a couple of years for me to write the book from end to end, and that was off and on. Uh, the mm-hmm. book is only about 130 pages, cover to cover. But um, I have um, I cite 70 references in my book. Again, if you can imagine 70 references in a 100 page book of content, um, it's quite a quite a hefty uh, load of academic rigor. And yeah, absolutely. And that's uh, that only represents about maybe 25 percent of the of the all the material that I read in preparation for for this book. I can imagine Uh, to your question, Rick, there were times when I enjoyed it. There were times when I just put the writing aside and <laughs> you know, for, for a couple of weeks or a couple of months <laughs> to, uh, to take a break. <laughs> yeah. And, and tell me about that moment that you recognized that, hey, look, I think this is done. How did it, how did it feel? It felt great. Yeah. It felt great. I, yeah. I was able to uh, I was able to exhale. <laughs> and, 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 and then and then the real work began rick and that is the marketing piece <laughs> so. so there are a lot of people on this call today who are uh, i guess aspiring authors they want to do a similar thing mm-hmm. that you've done and actually get a book out there mm-hmm. um what would you say to them do you know just start writing i would just say start writing you know what i did rick is over the years um when it's 
thought would um, you know would come to mind, I would jot it down in the notes section of my iPhone. Mm -hmm. And so I had a ton of notes built up over the years in my iPhone and in my personal journal. So I was able to retrieve those notes and kind of expand on them. So the book kind of built itself yeah. uh, in a sense. So I would say to aspiring authors, just start writing. When an idea, if you have that passion, I mean, if you have that desire and that desire turns into a passion, if that thought is with you consistently, then you definitely want to be a writer. So start writing uh, little post-it notes or whatever. Uh, start writing down ideas as they pop into your mind. Mm -hmm. And then put pen to paper when you have a free time. Are you a morning person? Do you like writing in the morning or afternoon? Oh, or whenever am, you can. <laughs> Rick, I am so much a morning person. I don't think I've ever done any writing in the evening. No. And I mean that literally. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell us, let's break down, I guess, the structure of the book. I think that's very important for people who want to get their hands on this. And we will be sharing how to do that later on in the call, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so what is the, the, I guess, the structure, the index, the, the way it's built? Well, I'll give you an idea. It's, it's, a, it, it's 12 chapters in total. I start mm -hmm. with an introduction, and then there's 12 chapters. Um, the uh, first chapter is on hypocritical leaders, um, which, which helps us to, to identify the hypocritical uh, leader. What are some of the things that, that uh, hypocritical leaders do and say that yeah. makes them hypocritical? And then I move on to chapter two, which talks about authentic leadership. On the one hand, we're talking about what's an inauthentic or hypocritical leader. And then I think I would have been, would have been remiss if I didn't talk about, well, the opposite side of the coin. What mm -hmm. is an authentic uh, leader? An, an authentic leader is, uh, I define that in my book, uh, and it's, it's a person that really, um, they, they lead uh, by their own, through their own conscience. They don't care what other people think. Their words align with their actions and so on. Yeah. And then I talk about the value of, of values, and that's where I go into talking about corporate corporate values and why they're so important to the company and all the other culture manifestos that are so important in, in creating the social structure um, uh, of the organization. And that's, that's a mission statement, uh, core values, and again, the vision statement. Then I talk about political correctness um, at work and how the PC movement um, mm. you know, has, has really taken a stronghold uh, in the business discourse. Yep. Uh, and guides everything that we do and say. And then I go into hypocrisy in the new woke woke culture. And as I said earlier in this interview, how companies um, kind of masquerade as being socially conscious. In other words, being woke. Yep. Um, and uh, much to, um, uh, you know, again, it's just simply put, it's, it's very, it's, it's hypocritical in many, many cases. Mm. Uh, and I cite many cases in the book where companies kind of pose as, as being uh, socially conscious when the evidence prevails that shows that they're, that they're not actually not. socially conscious. Yeah. And then I go into, you know, diversity and inclusion, the myth, um, you know, tokenism and the inclusion illusion. So lots of interesting, uh, I think chapters in the book, uh, hypocrisy and human resources, uh, the unpleasant consequences of hypocrisy, where yep. I really get into the meat of how hypocrisy uh, affects not only, um, not only the business uh, image, but it also affects employees and customers and, and shareholders. And then I go into a really interesting chapter called The Dark Side of Emotional Intelligence and how leaders uh, use emotional intelligence to, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, for their own, for their purposes. own good. Yep. Yes, exactly. And then uh, chapter 11 speaks to truth telling and how it, truth telling ain't easy uh, is the actual uh, title. While many leaders want to tell the truth, they eventually, again, their conscience kind of gives way. Uh, to you know, to um, to uh, to the to the uh, pursuit of profit, and meeting the bottom line, and then chapter twelve kind of ties it all together. Um, you know, the, uh, why actions matter more than words. Yeah, wow, what a what an yeah. amazing breakdown. You you talk about actions more important than words. I wonder, from a I guess a practical implementation standpoint, we understand that there's always a theory component to a book like this, but. What are the, I guess, the practical steps people will be taking? Is there some sort of a, a further action steps? Can people get further help from you when they want to do this and implement this in their own business? Um, well, I mean, absolutely. I'm always, I do get, get, get emails from people that have brought my book, you know, with questions. And the mm. people, you know, you know they, they go into my website and send, uh, send comments through there uh, as well. So, yes, I have uh, helped uh, some people, um, you, know, um, you know, on occasion. Um, but I think the practical steps are, uh, I would love for leaders to actually take this book and really do some introspection 
and look at themselves. And I think that's one of the things that people tell me they get out of the book is it causes them to be introspective and ask themselves, well, hey, do I do this or do I that? do that? Yeah. And more importantly, uh, this book is used by many people uh, in, in, their, uh, in their management meetings. It's a great conversation starter mm -hmm. uh, for, 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 for leaders. Absolutely. No, because oftentimes, uh, some of the things that we do um, kind of escape our consciousness, Rick, uh, as, as leaders. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a good uh, roundtable sort of conversation starter, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. So where are people going to be able to get their, their hands on this wonderful book should they want to buy it? Well, any major online retailer like Barnes & Noble, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Amazon, of course, um, online and, and some bookstores. Excellent. So I know that you also have a website and uh, we'll be um, sharing that momentarily. But what can people, yes. I guess, find on that site when they get there? Well, they'll find um, a book trailer. They'll find um, testimonials. They'll find uh, interviews uh, and a little more insights into into my, my background. Excellent. So uh, that being um, said, what is the website where people are going to uh, go to connect? HumanCapitalGuru.com. That's Love. human capital c a p i t a l guru dot com well there you have it everybody if you're on this call today you're a leader in that position where you want to turn around that hypocrisy and um, do some good in the world and make a difference yes. in your own organization certainly reach out and grab your uh, copy of the book at humancapitalguru.com mate now, no matter where you see the call i'm going to be making sure that this link back to uh, this wonderful book and dr williams uh, work is available to you and with all that being said dr williams thank you so very much for joining me on the show today my pleasure, Rick. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed the call, then make sure to subscribe, leave a comment, share us with your friends, and book your spot on the show at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. And if you're looking for solutions that will help grow your business, then visit myfuturebusiness.com forward slash shop.